Hello and welcome back to this week's Office Hours. I'm Bob Reich, and you're here, and I'm with you, and this is live. It is not, uh, well, it, it's live if you are here with me now, uh, and the time is, uh, at least on the West Coast, it's 4 o'clock, and on the East Coast, it's 7 o'clock. We're doing it uh, sort of differently than we do normally. Normally, we're on Thursday, but don't worry about it. Just make sure, if you know anybody who would like to catch this live, that you share this with them right now and spread the word to dozens of people. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. News of the week. Biggest news, obviously, is Michigan and the upset in Michigan. Bernie Sanders taking Michigan. You know, it's an upset only because the pollsters were so wrong. If, it had, if the pollsters hadn't been so wrong, it would not be considered an upset. But the pollsters, look at, here is what the pollsters, I, this is my what my pay no attention to the pollsters plug all right these are pollsters that have red faces because they got it so wrong this is a pollster these are the three major polls one had 17 percent lead for hillary clinton uh in monday going into the tuesday michigan the other had 22 percent lead and the other gave her a 31 percent lead and so it was an upset because the pollsters were so wrong and why are pollsters wrong i'll tell you Political pollsters exist in order to make astrologers look good. And they do this. Why are they wrong? They were wrong, number one, because some of them used, you know, when they do their polls, they do samples, and they call people and say, well, are you a Democrat? And if so, are you registered? Are you, who are you going to vote for? Some of the calls were actually done on landlines. But you see, young people don't have landlines. Hmm? Duh? And another group of pollsters, what they were doing, it's almost impossible for pollsters to predict how many uh, independents and also how many young people. And they just made a wild estimate of young people, and they were wrong. There were many, many more young people and many more independents who were there and also voting for Bernie Sanders. And then they also did something which I think is a little bit race, racial stereotyping. Uh, the pollsters assumed that because African Americans voted, only 20% of them voted for Bernie Sanders in the Southern primaries, that only 20% of them would vote for Bernie Sanders in Michigan. Uh, now, that's, I mean, isn't that a little bit of racial stereotyping? I mean, if Southern African Americans are all going to be just like Michigan African Americans, well, Bernie Sanders did much better. So where do we go now? Now, look at, the, I have a little chart here. What do you think of this? This is a, how do you like that? Actually, I, it's from the New York Times. But nevertheless, uh, John King, eat your heart out. Uh, this is, a, this is a map. This shows, the green shows where Bernie has won caucuses or primaries. Uh, the blue is where Hillary Clinton has won uh, caucuses or primaries. And you can see uh, that Hillary has done very, very well in the South. Uh, the problem is most of those states are going to, in the general election, vote Republican, right? Uh, Bernie has done very, very well in New England and in the Midwest. Uh, and uh, and this was a draw. This is Iowa and Nebraska. He did very well. Colorado he did very well. Uh, he came very, very close in Nevada. Well, uh, these armed states are the next round. This, this is where we are going with this march. Uh, and it is the next, uh, actually next Tuesday. So you have here uh, states like Illinois, and you have uh, uh, here Missouri, and you have Ohio, very, very important states. Uh, Florida, and then, uh, and then uh, the, the following week, uh, Wisconsin. You see, if you see this pattern, I think Bernie's chances are pretty good in this region because he's talking about the problems of jobs and wages, and he's probably talking about it in a way that people can understand. Uh, now, I am not a an old time protectionist in terms of trade. But Bernie Sanders is pointing out something that people feel and understand in their hearts, and that is the blue-collar workers have been screwed in this country. And it's not just uh, trade and outsourcing of jobs. It's also uh, the deunionization of America. You know, only 7% of American workers in the private sector are now unionized. Uh, in the 50s, you had 35%, a third of workers in the private sector were unionized, a lot of them in the industrial Midwest. You know, this was union country. Uh, this is also a country where uh, if you've got big companies that are, uh, that become uh, companies that are essentially takeover targets or companies that are, uh, uh, you know, that, that Wall Street, Wall Street, that you see Wall Street right over here? 
You can't see it, can you? It's right, right, follow my finger. There's a little tiny place called Wall Street that has basically taken over the economy and basically instructed, began instructing in the 1980s, every company to maximize shareholder returns. Think nothing of anybody else. Employees, just think about shareholders. Don't care about your communities, just think about your shareholders. Well, what happens to a lot of these workers, blue collar workers, well, when only shareholder maximizing shareholder returns is the thing that corporations do, obviously there is pressure down, downward pressure. So a lot of these companies, they move to states that are called right to work states. If there was ever a phrase that has a that was meaningless and also averse, averse to what is actually happening, it's it's right to work. What what it, right to work states is is right to have a lousy job and low pay. Uh, because they, it, it's very hard to organize a union in right-to-work states, and that's what a lot of these companies did that were in the Rust, Rust Belt. So Bernie Sanders is speaking to the problems of these Americans, and it's not just white blue-collar Americans, it is black blue-collar Americans. One of the biggest stories that is not being told, and that's why we do this 30 minutes, office hours, is because of the stories that are not being told. One of the biggest stories not being told is so many African-American blue-collar workers, working-class African-Americans, lost their jobs. They were in the middle class. They had good union jobs. They couldn't stay there. Once these factories started moving abroad, once we basically de-industrialized a lot of America, including the Midwest, then if you look at the job ladder, the middle rungs on that job ladder were taken out of that job letter. If you don't have a college degree, you don't any longer have the capacity to get a really good paying middle class job, which we used to have in this country. Blacks and whites have suffered as a result of this. Bernie's talking about it, and that's why I think he will do well. But I'm not gonna make any predictions, because remember political predictions? What I said about political predictions? You remember? They make astrologers look good. Okay, I also want to talk about Wall Street's bonus pool. Now, you got a lot of Wall Street. It was announced this week. Wall Street, uh, really, uh, the bonus pool went down 9%, and you had a lot of Wall Streeters who were, who were just crying. I mean, they're not, they're not going to get their bonuses, so they'll get a, a, little, a little bit of a bonus. That is ridiculous. The bonuses this year that Wall Street got, just this year, Wall Street bonuses, were enough to lift every fast food minimum wage worker up to $15 an hour if we're spread out over fa every fast food worker in this country. So I'm not going to I'm not going to cry a tear for Wall Street workers, Wall Street executives, Wall Street traders whose bonus went down a little bit. Please. Speaking of which, another big issue this week nobody's talking about tax amnesty. Now, very quietly, what's happening in Washington right now, I was in Washington yesterday, I talked to some people involved in this. There are now corporate lobbyists all over Capitol Hill, and here's what they're doing. They are basically trying to get a tax amnesty for their companies. Now, what does that mean? It means that, well, you've got to, you, you've got to understand, right now, big corporations, global corporations headquartered in the United States, they've got about 2.1% trillion dollars of money parked abroad, mostly in tax havens, so they don't have to pay U.S. taxes. 2.1 trillion. And what they're waiting for is for the United States to say, oh, 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 we're, we're so sorry. We're so sorry you have to pay 35 percent. That's the normal corporate tax. Uh, but but if you come back, bring, bring your money back, we'll give you a special deal. We'll do, give you an amnesty. You can bring your money back. We'll give you what Obama, President Obama, is now uh, offering on the Hill, offering Republicans 10 percent. Special deal, 10 percent. There are some, believe it or not, there are some Democrats who are now saying that's not, that's not low enough. We want to go to 8 percent or 6.5 or percent. I heard yesterday, 6.5 percent. Now listen, this is big money. Now, if you are a corporation, you've got billions of dollars overseas, and you hear that there's rumor of an amnesty, are you going to bring the money back? No! You're going to wait till there's an amnesty. Why would you bring the money back? The best way of dealing with these corporations that are parking their money abroad is not give them anything. Don't give them an amnesty. This is extortion. How do you deal with extortionists? 
you don't deal with extortionists. That's how you deal with extortionists. They should not expect that they're going to get a, a tax amnesty. They should not, and they won't. And you know what some of these corporations are doing, some of these lobbyists? They're going around saying, well, if you don't give us a tax amnesty, not only are we going to keep this money there, but we might even follow Pfizer and move abroad where taxes are cheaper. Please. If they want to move abroad, let them go. If they don't want to be American companies anymore, forget it. They don't have to be American companies. But if they're not American companies anymore, you know what? They're not going to get protected, their assets, their intellectual property abroad. The United States government is not going to protect them. The United States government is not going to represent them in international treaty negotiations. The United States government is not going to represent them with regard to all sorts of uh, dispute settlements internationally about American corporations versus foreign corporations. Forget it. They're not Americans. They want to go abroad. Goodbye. Now, finally, we come to the por portion of our half hour where I have the privilege, the, the unique privilege of, of giving you my sense of what the worst of the week is. What is the worst of the week? What is the worst thing, the most outrageous, outrageous thing that happened this week? The worst of the week is Donald Drumpf. Drumpf, you know, John Oliver's, that's what he's been calling him, and he's right. Uh, that was the original name of, of Donald Trump. It was Donald Drumpf. I mean, that was his family name, Drumpf. And so we're going to call him Drumpf. And what did the Drumpf do? Well, the Drumpf has been inciting violence. I mean it. I, I just want to quote this morning. I mean, uh, yesterday, uh, a, Trump, uh, a Trump supporter was criminally uh, charged with assault at a Trump rally in North Carolina. The, the rally happened Wednesday. Uh, you probably know about this. Uh, and it's been a pattern. It's been going on for a while uh, at a Las, Las, a Las Vegas uh, rally last month. Here's what Trump, Trump said. Dr the Drump, I'm sorry. Here's what the Drump said. I'd like to punch him in the face. He said, referring to a protester who had been removed. And then the Drump told the crowd, quote, you know what I hate? There's a guy totally disruptive, throwing punches. We're not allowed to punch back anymore. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when there were, they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. And then this morning, the Drumpf elaborated on that statement. He said, the audience swung back, and I thought it was very, very appropriate. He was swinging, uh, he was hitting people, and the audience hit back. And that's what we need a little bit more of. We need a little bit more of mobs of people striking protesters, often black protesters. That's what we need. We need people being taken out on stretchers from rallies. Now, there hasn't been a single video of any protester being violent. A lot of people have iPhones. They could have videoed them if there was actually violence. There are also police officers who are, have authority to stop any violence. So what Donald Trump is actually saying is that he not only condones violence, he's inviting violence. That's the worst of the week. It's the worst of the month. My friends, I'm reminded of what the late Martin Luther King said, and I can only paraphrase, but he said, we have not only to repent for the violent and bad acts of the bad people, but for the silence of the good people. We have got to denounce Donald Trump and his antics and his insightfulness of violence and very, very thinly veiled racial coded violence. There is no place in America for this. There's no place in America for a presidential candidate, the leading presidential candidate of one of our major parties, saying this and doing this and acting this way. All right. I've got it out of my system for the time being. Uh, let's take your questions, and the questions begin. All right. Uh, this is from Tonya Silvestri. Uh, Tonya says, 4 p.m. Pacific? What happened to our lunch date, Robert Reich? Tonya, I'm sorry. We'll get back next week. We'll go back to to, to 12, 12 noon. I, I, I enjoy having lunch with you, Tonya. I really I really do. I just I was in a plane yesterday, and, I, and the plane was delayed, and I won't even go into it. Gordon Roberts, do you think that a significant number of Bernie supporters will really stay home or even vote for Trump? 
the drumpf. Gordon, look, I can't imagine anybody, forget Bernie supporters, I can't imagine anybody in their right mind voting for the drumpf. All right, this is uh, Duncan Taylor. If Bernie is not the nominee, do you believe that Bernie supporters writing in his name or even writing GOP is a good option? Uh, Duncan, if the option, if the, if the real option, if, if, we're, if, if Donald Trump, Trump is going to be the GOP presidential candidate, we don't know that yet. If he's going to be the pres GOP presidential candidate, then if you don't vote for the candidate opposing the Trump, you are inviting the Trump into office. Uh, Dan Wopert, do you think the term socially responsible democratic capitalism, that's quite a term, Diane, is an accurate and perhaps more broadly palatable way to portray Sanders' proposals? Uh, socially responsible democratic capitalism. Uh, look, I, I, I think that that's how I read it. I mean, to, when Bernie Sanders talks about free public higher education, uh, that's a continuation of K through 12. We don't talk about, talk about K through 12 as socialist. K through 12 is the, you know, public education. K through 12 is the backbone of, of American education. We want to improve it. We don't want to, we don't want it to be thought of as, as kind of a socialist foreign invention. And what we've done in this country, we started with public K through, actually one through eight, and then we extended it to one through nine, and then we extended it to one through 12, K through 12. Uh, and uh, we, uh, some places have, have public uh, child care and early childhood education, uh, and we need more education. People have to be better educated for the jobs of the future. So why not continue that tradition of public education, free public education? That's not socialism. You say it's socially responsible democratic capitalism, yes. And, and also, you know, the single-payer health system that almost every other major industrial uh, society has is cheaper, it delivers better health care. Uh, people are going broke right now, even with uh, public, even with public help, even, even, under, even under the Affordable Care Act, uh, with, with co-payments and deductibles that keep on growing. A private insurance industry that's making huge amounts of money off of you and off of me. Spending it on, on executive salaries, on, on advertising and marketing, Adrian Matal, uh, Adrian, you say, I was leaning toward Bernie until I saw what he thinks about Cuba. Adriana, what are you talking about? You mean that, that uh, you mean in 1985, more than three decades ago, he had something nice to say about the Cuban educational system and the Cuban healthcare system? And that's going to make you not vote for Bernie? Come on. Rick Thwaites, do you think Bernie is properly connecting the dots between his vision and the reality of D.C.? Uh, Rick, the reality of D.C., I was in D.C. yesterday. You know what the reality of D.C. is? The reality of D.C. is money. It's lobbyists. It's, it's trade associations. It is engulfing. The Democratic Party, the Republican Party has been there for years. Do you think you are represented in Washington? Now, I don't know, Rick. Maybe you are. Maybe you're a CEO. Maybe you run the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. But I don't think you are. Or you do, and I don't think you're, you're represented, and, and I'm not represented. And so Bernie's entire political revolution is about returning our democracy to us, to the people. And so how do you connect the dots? You don't connect the dots. You have a democracy, or you have what we have now. And this is not a new problem, but it's got much, much worse over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And Citizens United has, has made it even, even worse. Jake Morrison, what are your predictions for the election on March 15th? Well, I, Jake, I already gave you my predictions. I think uh, Bernie's going to do extremely well. But predictions, I warned you, did I not? Political predictions exist to make astrologers look good. Eddie Negeo Itano, uh, what were your thoughts about NAFTA back then, and what are they now? I, Eddie, I was in the Clinton administration. I was Secretary of Labor. Uh, I did not like NAFTA. In fact, I was very vociferous against NAFTA, but it was in the cards. Uh, the corporate America, Wall Street, they wanted it. Uh, inside the administration, uh, the best I could do was have uh, 
stronger labor protections, stronger environmental protections. Uh, but look at when you serve in the cabinet, uh, you are either going to be a member of the team or you're going to resign. And I did not resign over that. I came pretty close to resigning over several things. But I'm not going to tell you. Steve Tice, how do you respond to Paul Krugman's criticism of Bernie on trade? Well, Steve, as far as I, I mean, I read uh, Paul, you're talking about Paul Krugman's column today in which he said, well, what he was saying, as I understand it, uh, is that trade is basically good. And I agree with him. Trade is basically good. The problem with trade uh, and the problem with trade policy is that over time, as you lose unions and as you lose uh, your kind of industrial base, and as I said before, as you move to a kind of capitalism that is not stakeholder-based capitalism, such as we had out early after the Second World War, but shareholder capitalism, uh, then all of the pressure is to reduce wages. And outsourcing jobs abroad is simply another tool that managements use to threaten workers that unless they settle for less money, uh, their jobs are going to be gone. So I think that if you envision and look at trade in that way, as it's now being used, the threat to move jobs abroad or moving jobs abroad, you see the trade just adds to the arsenal. It reduces even further the power of workers to get better jobs and have better wages. This is why we have the top 1% with almost 20% of total national income right now. This is why we are seeing the most unequal distribution of income and wealth we've seen in this country since 1918. Thomas Liu. In college undergrad economic courses, I was taught uh, more free trade is always better. Free trade agreements like NAFTA are criticized for being unfair to workers. Can you explain why this is? Well, I think I just did. Uh, again, free trade, free trade is good because it gives us all access to cheaper products. That's good. That's good. But the burden of free trade has fallen disproportionately on blue-collar workers. Now, in theory, the winners from free trade could compensate the losers and come out ahead, but it's never done. They don't compensate the losers. We, had, we used to have something called trade adjustment assistance. Do you remember that? That was something that would, 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 was supposed to be given to workers that lost their jobs because of trade. Now, I was partly involved in administering that because as Secretary of Labor, that was one of my jobs. It was impossible to do because you never knew why somebody lost a job. Did they lose it because of trade? Or did they lose it because of technology? And you were, it was the most, it was a bureaucratic nightmare. We do need a system in this country that is a re-employment system that gives people a good chance of getting a good new job that pays as well as the job they have lost. But we don't have any, anything like that. We're not moving in that direction at all. Jonathan Coit, what is your response to the libertarian idea? You know, I don't even have to read the rest of your question, Jonathan. The libertarian idea? I don't even... All right, I'll go on. What's your response to the libertarian idea that income tax is theft? I think it's bullshit. You know, as Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great jurist, said, uh, that taxes, income taxes, are the price we pay for a civilized society. Liz, Bowen, Cluley, what do you think about a financial transaction tax? Uh, well, I think it, it's, it's a very good idea. Bernie is proposing it. It's been proposed for, for many years. It's not something, it's not a radical idea. Uh, even a member of John F. Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors proposed a financial transaction tax. That's a small tax, you know, a little one-tenth of one percent or whatever it, it might be on every financial transaction. That yields a lot of money. It slows down speculation. It puts a little bit of dirt in the wheels of speculative commerce. Uh, a lot of that is a zero-sum game. You know, it's just a taking money from one pocket and putting it into another and, and yielding a lot of money for Wall Street. Why not just get some money out of all of that? and stop the speculation, or at least reduce the speculation. Edward, Edmund, I'm sorry, Edmund, Edmund Seymour. That's a, that's a nice name. Can the U.S. achieve full employment by changing the way we control inflation? Well, Edmund, if what you are getting at is that the Federal Reserve Board is now in the process of raising interest rates to control inflation, and we would do better if the Fed was actually keeping interest rates low so that people could borrow 
and therefore spend, and there could be more commerce, more act economic activity, and therefore more jobs, you are absolutely right. Because there is no inflation. There is no inflation. Have you seen any inflation? Look under your bed. Look in your closet. Look in your closet. Look in your, look in your garage. See if you can find any inflation. There is no inflation. The Federal Reserve is seeing a phantom. It ought to keep interest rates low. Res good pace. Is that, is that res? Res. What's up with central banks charging negative interest rates? Uh, well, the central bank of the United States is not charging negative interest rates, but negative interest rates uh, are something that I think that central banks certainly are moving toward, and in some cases they are actually uh, trying some experiments. Uh, what a negative interest rate actually is, is it, it, it says it penalizes savers, because if you keep a lot of money in the bank, or if you keep a lot of money in bonds, or if you keep a lot of money in reserve and you're not spending it, uh, you're not going to get a lot of interest off of that. In fact, you might actually have to pay the banks. The banks bank you will charge you for parking your money. Now, that may seem a little bit odd, and it does seem a little weird, but there is a logic to it. Because if you don't have enough spending in the economy, uh, if, uh, if government and individuals are not spending enough to keep the economy going, uh, not only is there a problem of recession, there's a problem of deflation. So you might want to have negative interest rates to avoid deflation. Prices start dropping, and then people don't buy because they say, well, prices are going to continue to, buy, to, to drop. And then you're really in trouble. That's a, really, that's a deflationary cycle. It's very, very dangerous. We're not near it in the United States. But I think that there is some chance of recession, even this year. The, the rest of the world is, is doing much worse than we are. Sean, is it Ward? Ward, Sean Ward. Do you agree that creating more employee-owned companies would be one of the best ways to revitalize the middle class? Well, more employee-owned companies certainly is a good way to revitalize the middle class, but here's the downside, and I want you to be aware of the downside. This is not, I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about employee-owned companies, but the downside is that if employees are putting all of their all of their eggs in one basket, all of their savings, all of their investment, it's all their, their, their employee ownership. Well, what happens if that company goes down? In other words, they're not diversifying their savings. You want to diversify your savings. If you've got any savings, you want to diversify it so that you're not caught if your one company that you happen to own really tanks. So I would combine employee ownership with some short sort of insurance policy. So many, many companies are sharing uh, that kind of risk, and many employees are sharing the risk. Uh, the other issue is how do you get capital? If it's employee owned, uh, how do you get you know, the investors who are not the employees to want to buy in? Uh, they may not feel comfortable. But we can talk about that. We can talk about it. It's, it's important. We ought to move forward with it. I'm, I'm not poo-pooing it at all. Max. Valdez, I've just seen your documentary on cable, and it really, well, it's, it's a documentary, you saw it on cable, it's not a documentary about the cable industry. You're talking about inequality for all. I've just seen your documentary on cable, and it really opened my eyes. Wish every American could watch it. Max, thank you. It's called Inequality for All. Uh, it's, on, uh, it's on Amazon Prime right now. You can see it, uh, uh, Netflix, for some reason, Netflix stopped carrying it. And Netflix was doing it for up until the uh, one year before the election. And after election day, Netflix is going to once again show inequality for all. I don't get it. Okay, last question. And here it is from Mario Kane. Uh, one question, when are we going to see you back to the nightly show panel? What nightly show panel? Mario? I mean, I do television occasionally, but isn't this better than television? Seriously. I mean, I, you know, I mean, right now, are you, we are communicating. I can tell you what I think. You can ask me questions. We can have our own kind of private conversation. And it doesn't have to be, it's, 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 you know, the cost of a television show, the cost of putting on a television show is huge. Do you know how much this costs to do? So I'm going to stick here, but I'll, I'll do the nightly show. I'll, anybody who wants me on television. I'll try to accommodate them. Anyway, it's a pleasure. My pleasure. I'm glad you tuned in for this special uh, office hours, this, this, uh, this sort of prime time. We're in prime time right now. Uh, we're not ready for prime time. 
Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I want to thank Zoe Umlaut, Umlaut, Beck, uh, Yael Bridge, Yael can't be with us tonight, but thank her anyway. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being the people you are. And, uh, and we're going to win. We are going to win. We're going to win back our democracy. We're going to win back our economy. And I can't wait. Bye.